tornado outbreaks. The storm chaser is a dream, but a nightmare for the people they impact. Although there usually is at least one tornado outbreak every year in the United States, it might not be very bad. However, usually a couple times in a lifetime, there's a tornado outbreak that is never forgotten. A super outbreak. There is no clear definition of what a super outbreak is, which, for this video, presents a problem. With no official form of ranking for outbreaks, there's a gray area for what you can consider to be historic. Fortunately, Thomas P. Grazalis created the Outbreak Intensity Score in 2023. The way it works is simple. Each significant tornado gives the outbreak points. An EF2 gives it 2 points, an EF3 5 points, EF4 10, and EF5 15 points. The grand total of these points then determines how severe the outbreak is. Any outbreak with over 250 points is considered a super outbreak, giving us three in recorded history, as well as a few others that come close. So, now with that background information, it's time to cover the five worst tornado outbreaks in recorded history. On May 3rd, 2003, the Storm Prediction Center issued a moderate risk for severe weather, stating that there were several conditions favorable for tornadoes becoming more prominent. On this day, 14 tornadoes would touch down, causing no injuries or deaths. However, this was the first day in an outbreak sequence that would last until the 11th, and the following day was going to be the most severe. On May 4th, the SPC issued a high risk, Conditions were now prime for severe weather, and in the afternoon, storms began to fire throughout Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas, and Missouri. In total, this day produced 87 tornadoes that would result in 38 deaths and over 300 injuries. The following day was another high risk, which resulted in 22 tornadoes only having two reported injuries. Overall, a much calmer day. However, on May 6th, a moderate risk was issued, now being the fourth day of heightened tornado activity in a row. The day started off mostly calm, with many smaller, weak tornadoes touching down here and there in the mid-afternoon. However, at around 8 p.m. Central Daylight Time, a tornado touched down just west of New Grand Chain, Illinois. The tornado is originally moving more east, at around this time, when the tornado was still in Pulaski County, a house was impacted, tragically killing a 48-year-old man when his home's chimney collapsed onto him. Near the Mazic County line, the tornado hit its max intensity, estimated to have 210 mile per hour peak winds. The tornado would disintegrate mobile homes and completely level modern homes, even sweeping a house clean off the foundation with the roof found in a creek 200 yards away. Unfortunately, two people lost their lives during this tornado, and another 33 were injured. Aside from this one tornado, the rest of the day was only responsible for another 27 injuries. For a day, the outbreak seemed to calm down. The 7th only had a slight risk issued, and nothing significant happened. But on the 8th, yet another high risk was issued. Storms began to fire at around 4 p.m. CDT, where an F4 would touch down right over Oklahoma City. The tornado occurred right over Moore, which is no stranger to tornadic activity. In fact, this tornado's path actually overlapped with that of the infamous May 3rd, 1999 F5. It touched down near Northwest 5th Street and Santa Fe Avenue. The tornado is moving east along 5th Street, initially being small with only F2 or F3 damage. As the tornado shifted more northeast, it widened to a fifth of a mile wide, then a quarter mile. Fast forward a bit and the tornado is now approaching Interstate 35, inflicting major damage on two hotels, tossing cars over 100 yards, and doing strong F3 damage to buildings. As it crossed I-35, it rolled a Greyhound bus with 23 passengers inside. Fortunately, nobody was killed here. The tornado continued onward, doing mostly F1 or F2 damage. As it crossed into Oklahoma County, it would once again strengthen and inflict F3 to F4 damage. The tornado ended up covering a total of 17.3 miles, however, not a single person was killed by it. The outbreak sequence continued on for three more days, having a moderate issued on the 9th, yet another high on the 10th, and a moderate on the 11th. 
However, these days didn't see much significant activity, especially compared to the past week. Overall, this outbreak lasted 9 days, producing 6 F4s, 18 F3s, and ended up killing over 40 people and injuring hundreds more. On the Outbreak Intensity Score, OIS, the May 2003 outbreak gets a 232, making it the 5th most deadly ever recorded. Now we're taking it back to 1965. There hadn't been very much progress in the meteorological community yet. In the late 1940s, weather radar had become a thing in the United States, and in the 1950s, the word tornado had been allowed to say after previously being banned. However, efforts to predict weather had only somewhat been established. The SELS, Severe Local Storms Unit, was basically the precursor of the Storm Prediction Center. On April 10th, there were eight known tornadoes that touched down, including one F4 that hit Conway, Arkansas, tragically killing six people and injuring another 200. However, this was just the beginning. On April 11, the SELS would issue a statement stating that there were tornadoes possible in northeast Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. Unfortunately, their predictions were off. The day started off slow, with only a few tornadoes in Iowa, Wisconsin, and Illinois in the early afternoon. However, in the late afternoon, storms began to fire all over Indiana. At around 5 p.m. CDT, a tornado would touch down southwest of Wakarusa, Indiana. The tornado was traveling rapidly northeast, right towards the town of Midway. At this same moment, Paul Huffman was traveling northwest, approaching Midway from the southeast. This combination allowed one of the most iconic tornado photos to be taken as the powerful F4 slammed right into Midway. This is one of six pictures Paul took, and you can see the tornado almost appears split, with two very defined vortices inside the main funnel. This behavior is known as a multi-vortex tornado. After passing Midway, the F4 continued on a straight path northeast until it dissipated 21 miles after touching down. However, it had already made its mark. 31 people were killed by this tornado, and another 250 were injured. The outbreak raged on, with tornadoes lasting into the night of the 11th, where the skies then began to clear. A total of 47 tornadoes touched down on the 11th, with a shocking 17 F4s. Overall, this outbreak received an OIS score of 238. Nearly 300 people lost their lives during this outbreak, and over 3,500 were injured. Now, we're going all the way back to the year 1917. There have been no significant efforts to predict the weather. Weather radar isn't even a thing yet, and you aren't allowed to publicly say the word tornado for fear of causing panic. It's the end of May, which has been a very slow month up to this point as far as tornadoes go. There have only been seven tornado reports in the US. However, that is about to change. A series of outbreaks that would last into June was brewing. It all started on May 25th, where despite only having six tornadoes, there would be one deadly F5. At around 2 p.m. CDT, tornado would touch down west of Wichita, Kansas. It was heading northeast and soon after its formation impacted the town of Andale, where 12 people were killed. It continued onward, eventually making it to the town of Sedgwick, killing another eight. The tornado remained on a fairly straight northeastern path for the majority of its entire life, curving more northward as it dissipated near the town of Florence. Overall, the tornado was on the ground for over 66 miles destroyed 118 buildings, and killed 23 people. The 26th told a very similar tale. Six tornadoes touched down, including five F4s. 110 people would die on this day. The 27th was even worse, producing 23 tornadoes, which killed 158 people. The skies then began to clear, and for the next two days, there were no tornadoes. Unfortunately, this grace period was short-lived, and the next three days would produce 19 tornadoes that resulted in the death of 89 people. This strangely isolated period of activity in May of 1917 is the first ever super outbreak, at least if you go by the OIS. 
it scored 296, having 64 tornadoes and almost 400 deaths in just over a week. Now we're back in the modern day, 2011. Weather awareness and knowledge about powerful storms are both at an all-time high. We have things like the Storm Prediction Center, National Weather Service, and even the Discovery Show Storm Chasers during this time. It's now officially cool to be a storm chaser. The year started off slow in January before an uptick of activity during February, as two small outbreaks occurred towards the end. During March, there were also slightly more tornadoes compared to the average. However, April started off with a bang, having an early outbreak on the 4th and 5th. The real devastation began towards the end of the month though. On the 26th, the Storm Prediction Center would issue a high risk for the day, claiming that the wind shear would be favorable for tornadic activity. They also issued a moderate risk for the following day, stating that the conditions were supportive of significant long-tracked tornadoes. During the 26th, 112 tornadoes touched down, which thankfully weren't extremely powerful and only resulted in the death of three people. However, the same could not be said about the following day. On the 27th, they upgraded the risk to high and stated that a tornado outbreak is expected and a few long track tornadoes and possibly a violent tornado or two may occur, which was very concerning. And unfortunately for everybody that lived in the risk area, they were exactly right. In the early afternoon, storms began to drop tornadoes left and right, and at 1.30 CDT, the first EF5 of the day would touch down near Philadelphia, Mississippi. This tornado was filmed by Reed Timmer and the Discovery camera crew as it formed, quickly intensifying. Most people remember this tornado because of the intense ground scouring it produced, digging up as much as two feet and tearing pavement from roads. It ended up killing three people and injuring another six. However, this was only the beginning of the onslaught of EF-5s. Soon after, at around 2.05, the Hackleberg EF-5 touched down. This tornado traveled a staggering 137 miles and entered two different states, killing 72 people and injuring almost 150 others. While the Hackleberg tornado was wreaking havoc in Alabama, at 2.42, the Smithville EF-5 would also touch down in eastern Mississippi and would quickly be known for some of the most extreme damage photos ever taken. Some of these included the curtains of a house being pulled through a gap in the ceiling. This was because of the lower pressure in a tornado, which is why people often say that you can tell if you're near a tornado if your ears start to pop. After traveling 37 miles at about 60 miles an hour, the tornado dissipated, leaving 23 dead and 137 injured. There were also 11 total EF-4s, all of which being extremely long-tracked and deadly. However, there's one specific infamous one that I want to focus on. At 3.43 p.m. CDT, a tornado touched down in northern Greene County and was moving east-northeast right towards the highly populated city of Tuscaloosa. The tornado was already a large and violent wedge and is usually remembered because of the very defined horizontal vortices it displayed. As it crossed town, residents would pull out their cameras to film. The tornado then continued to move through more rural areas as it approached the even larger city of Birmingham. The monster tornado would cross into northern areas of the city before dying off shortly after, being on the ground for over an hour and a half, killing 64 people. On top of the death toll, the tornado injured over 1,500 people and caused over $2 billion of property damage all by itself. The destruction continued on throughout the night as the tornadoes began to head more north. This day saw 173 tornadoes, four of which being rated EF-5. 316 people lost their lives, and almost 3,000 were injured. The outbreak overall saw 367 tornadoes touch down and was responsible for some of the worst damage ever from severe weather. The outbreak caused over $10.2 billion in damage, which today would be over $14 billion. 
It also scored a tremendous 378 on the OIS, and was the worst tornado outbreak if you're going by the destruction it caused. However, it isn't quite the highest scoring on the scale. On the morning of April 3rd, 1974, the SELS would issue the Severe Weather Outlook, essentially being the predecessor of the convective outlooks we have today. They would state there was potential for scattered severe thunderstorms across several states in the Midwest, including Texas, Arkansas, Ohio, the list goes on. Although this outbreak was only expected to last a single day, the impact it had was unprecedented. The first tornadoes began in the early afternoon from 12 to 3 p.m. CDT. Within this time frame, three different F5 tornadoes had already touched down alongside five F4s. Of these F5s, there was the incredibly powerful Xenia F5, touching down south of Bellbrook at around 1.30 p.m. The tornado was moving northeast, and very soon, it went right through the center of Xenia. The damage here was so severe, Dr. Ted Fujita, the creator of the F scale himself, preliminarily rated this tornado an F6, before later changing his mind, claiming that F6 damage would be inconceivable. After Xenia, the tornado struck Wilberforce, and then after that, Northern Cedarville. The tornado's rampage finally ended 31 miles after it began killing 36 people and injuring over 1,000. There was even a video taken of this tornado as it hit Xenia, taken by 16-year-old Bruce Boyd, showcasing the tornado's multi-vortex behavior. In the next six hours, four more F5 tornadoes would touch down, bringing the overall total to seven, and making it the most in any single day ever. This day saw 144 tornadoes and 310 deaths, paired with over 5,000 injuries, with property damage equal to almost $4 billion today. Strangely enough, even with the improved radar, forecasting, and weather awareness, there was still a similar loss of life during the 2011 super outbreak. A great reminder that no matter how much we study weather, it will remain beyond our control, and the best we can do is take cover. This outbreak scored a shocking 578 on the OIS, making it, by these standards, the worst tornado outbreak in recorded history.